talented uh, speaker, Professor Animi Bantia. Uh, is a professor uh, distinguished of, uh, of, <clears throat> of uh, from University of British Columbia in, in Canada. Uh, professor uh, Bantia uh, research areas are focusing on material science, uh, structure engineering, sensing, and artificial intelligence applied uh, to infrastructures. Uh, Professor Bantia chaired more than 30 international conferences and uh, given more than 250 uh, keynote speak, uh, speech in different countries. He awarded 30 international awards. Uh, he's uh, a fellow of the ACI, Canadian Society of Civil Engineers, Indian Concrete Institute, uh, Canadian Academy uh, Engineering, Indian uh, National uh, Academy of Engineering, and Royal Society of Canada. Uh, Professor uh, Bantia, uh, founding scientific director of India Canada Research Center. And he has many awards. Uh, uh, Professor Bantia will give us a talk about bio, uh, bio mim mimic uh, smart and functional uh, cement based uh, composite. So please, Professor Ning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, first of all, to the organizers for this opportunity. And uh, uh, what I'd like to cover today is, I think, some of the work we're doing on uh, new types of fiber reinforcement, and particularly on the biomimic and, and smartness side. So. Um, now, there's been a great deal of work done on ultra high performance concrete, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, you know, significant amount of work around the world that's been done, particularly on self-compacting ultra high performance concrete. There's been numerous, uh, you know, applications of that. We have used a fair bit of packing density theory, et cetera. You know, strength has been really generally very high. But I think one of the unfortunate problems with UHPC currently or ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete is that we are still using unengineered and borrowed fibers from ceramic matrix, polymer matrices and metal matrix composites. And I think the effort here uh, we are uh, making is I think to really redesign these fibers for um, application to these ultra high performance cement based uh, composite materials. So my presentation is actually dealing with four types of novel fibers that we're working with, uh, basically uh, addressing a number of the issues that actually some of these fibers or, or current fibers actually bring up. Uh, so the one fiber that I want to describe is the co-extruded bi-component fiber, uh, clearly for, for surface functionalities, uh, that's really the type of material that is best suited for better bonding and, and other sort of functionalities that I'll talk about, particularly for sensor use. Uh, leads me to conductive fibers for sensors, which are again uh, fibers that have had their, their uh, electrical conductivity enhanced in some way. Next, I'll move to the carbon neutral scrap tire fiber. These are the new fibers that we are developing. We have de designed a better um, you know, method for extracting scrap tire form from, from the uh, used tires themselves. And then finally, I'll go into the surface exalted cellulose fibers. So we are using these in terms of biomimic fibers, which have been refined lightly uh, and are utilized more for internal curing in these systems, which generally tend to have very high um, autogenous shrinkage. So let me start off with the uh, typical problem that we noticed in some of these uh, ultra high performance fiber reinforced systems is the poor bond. And a lot of the fibers that we are using, which come from, high, from polyolefin family, for example, they generally tend to have very poor bond with cement-based materials. And I think that really, as a building block, shows up quite poorly, uh, I believe, in the, in, in the long-term performance. So what do we do with when you have a fiber which has a poor bond? And now there have been a number of coatings developed uh, as bond enhancers. First and foremost, with steel fibers, we would do mechanical deformations, surface modifications, or surface indentations and notches. But also at the same time, we have had a number of spray coatings. Titanium oxide has been used, polyvinyl alcohol has been used. 
aluminum oxide has been used, some porcelains have been used as coatings. And also uh, there's been a fair bit of work done on even using shrinkage reducing admixtures just to change the surface chemistry itself. Problem with these coatings, unfortunately, is that they generally peel off and that they're really not they're really not stable. And what we are designing here, I think, are fiber systems where that particular fiber that is going to a cement-based system has a coating uh, which is actually part of the fiber itself. So it is actually fused onto the fiber system as we are actually looking at. And I think these functional coatings can actually have a number of other benefits as well, other than bond enhancement itself. So let me first describe these extrusion process that we have developed, which is essentially a co-extrusion with multiple layered uh, components. Uh, a typical co-extruded system has a, 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 what we call a core and a sheath. And the sheath is actually thermally infused into the core. So imagine a core has a polyolefin material, which is generally a cheap uh, polyolefin system, which could be polypropylene, it could be polyester, et cetera, which generally melts at a low temperature. And then you can then actually co-extrude this along with the sheath material, which could have your base polyolefin, which could be again a polypropylene type material, but then you can add an additive to that. And that additive in the sheath material is the one which is actually the functional system. And this kind of a sheath and core concept uh, is really the one where I think you can get significantly enhanced fiber performance because you have this functional material on the sheath and the sheets are generally only microns thick. So you could use in fact, even an expensive material in the sheath, but because it's a surface functionality and the contact with the matrix is only at the, at the, at the, at the sheath level, you really can actually work with a system which, has got, which requires very small amount of the functional material itself. So one particular formulation that I want to describe is the co-extrusion with a bi-component system where we're looking at number of additives. And I'm, I'm gonna describe three additives at this stage, I think that we're looking at and in this, poly, this, this additive, which is going on to the, into the sheath uh, material itself with the core always remaining a, a, an inexpensive polyolefin material such as polypropylene or polyester. So one uh, material that we're working with is, uh, with, is, is, is with uh, polyvinyl alcohol. And here I think you will see, oh, sorry, for, with silica fume. So clearly when you have a sheath, which has now got a polyolefin infused silica fume in the sheath material itself with the core being polyolefin, what it does is it produces an extremely high porcelanic surface uh, active material on the, on the surface of the fiber. And here you can see when you look at the bond slip response, the specific fiber reinforcement, you'll see the control response, and then you'll see the response of the fiber, which has got a silica fume in its sheath. And you can immediately see that with silica fume reacting with the calcium hydroxide in the, in the surface, uh, in the material itself on the matrix side, you produce, in fact, a much better uh, bond slip response and a much better bond in the system itself. So you are somehow counteracting that problem with, with a low bond. The second material we're dealing with is polyvinyl alcohol, which could be done, in fact, in the nano and the macro form. Here, we are looking at polyvinyl alcohol. Again, polyvinyl alcohol has a low contact angle, and it's also a hydrophilic material. So when you put polyvinyl alcohol in the sheath itself, what you'll notice is that, again, through a bond slip response, this fiber is enhanced. It is, has got a much better enhanced response to a, 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 you know, an applied interfacial load, So which means that you are enhancing its bond with respect to you know, a, a you know the, the bonds response, and of course, also the the matrix uh, toughness in the long in the long run as well. Finally, I want to describe when we have tried to combine these two materials. So what we have done is we have looked at polyvinyl alcohol in the in the sheet, but now we have replaced silica fume with nano silica, and you can see that you get this tremendous enhancement in the in the in the surface functionality and the bonds. So you have a control, and then you have basically. Uh, uh, a polyvinyl alcohol with nanosilica. And you can see that you can now completely enhance the, the bond slip response to, in order to get a very high uh, you know, a bond, a, you know, bond at the surface itself. And also a ductile bond, which means that you are still avoiding a fiber fracture, which means that you are getting this material, which has got a much better you know, toughness response uh, itself actually. So, and, and the benefit of this process is that now this particular sheath is fused into the core and these additives are fused into the sheath, basically, which already has 
comprised of the polyvinyl of the of the, of the polyolefin itself, which makes it in fact a very stable system as such. When you look at now the contact angle, you can see that one of the benefits, I think, of converting a hydro, hydrophobic material into a hydrophilic material is to change its contact angle. And through this contact angle response, you'll see that when we did, say, 5% PVA on the surface itself, you get almost an 18% reduction in the, in the contact angle. Poly, uh, the, the silica fume, obviously not, because the silica fume is not a hydro, hydrophilic material, but you do get, in fact, a, a slight reduction. But when you combine the two, you'll, you get, in fact, a synergized response where you're looking at a reduction in the contact angle. So what it's showing you is that, in fact, we are able to convert this hydrophobic surface into, into a hydrophilic surface. Now, we're taking this technology into the next level now. So you're now looking at engineered surfaces. And I, I, I personally believe that you're only limited by your, your imagination here. So you could add number of uh, you know, functional coatings on the fibers. Uh, you, you're looking at reactivity, catalysis, which we are looking at. You can add thermal coatings on it. You're looking at, we are looking at mechanical properties, adhesion, capillary forces. You can change the optical properties of the fiber itself through um, you know, it's option in scattering of light, perhaps useful in, in sensors, electrical properties. You can also change this electrical properties, which I'm going to show next, actually, through, through putting, in fact, say, conductive coatings on the fiber itself. And of course, magnetic properties, you can bring some super magnetic effects. And uh, one, of the prob uh, one of the applications of this particular fiber I want to design, uh, describe basically through our center, which is with India called IC Impacts, is that we build this one kilometer road with this, with this uh, co-extruded fiber uh, in, in a small village uh, called Tondebhavi. So I think we're taking um, these technologies now to actual uh, real life applications. And uh, what we noticed is that when we place this one kilometer not self-healing road in this particular small village in India, uh, of, of course, I mean, there is, this is a, a, a self-healing high performance system. But one thing we noticed was, and in terms of community transformation, the, the per capita income of the villager as a result of this road went up by 20%. And I think I, I really uh, see that, that, that I think the, the advantages of sort of uh, taking these technologies can, in fact, lead to community transformation into uh, villages where I think now you have this village, which is, in fact, a tiny village, but it probably has the world's most advanced road system. Taking this to the other functional coatings, it could also be for, uh, for, for conductive uh, fibers. So we can take these coatings in order to produce sensors. So here is, I think, some of the work we're doing with piezoresistive fibers uh, or piezoresistive uh, cement-based materials, so which have a conducting fiber systems. You have, in fact, a greater conductivity. And now it becomes, in fact, a piezoresistive material. And not we are not where you can actually use it as a sensor for strain or stresses. But I think we are also taking it to the next level. We're starting to use this, in fact, for chemo resistivity, which means that if you had, for example, as a, as a smart patch with, uh, as, as a leak detector system into, uh, into uh, you know, pipeline system, for example, these patches could also indicate at the time of leak that there's in fact a, a, a chemoresistive response. And you can see basically uh, that in fact, it can act as a wonderful patch on, on, a, on a pipeline for uh, this kind of a particular application. And these sensors tend to be extremely, extremely sensitive. So if you're looking at in fact, uh, the gauge factor, I think you're looking at in fact, gauge factor, almost an order of magnitude greater than the gauge factor from traditional sensors. So I think this really is, shows that this you're only limited by your imagination when it comes to coding these fiber systems. Next, I want to move to carbon neutral scrap tire fiber. Again, carbon neutrality. Canada wants to be carbon neutral by 2050. India wants to be carbon neutral by 2070. And I think I really believe that I think one area where we need to work with is in fact bringing carbon neutral systems or carbon neutral fibers, which are coming from different recycled stream into, into our concrete. So one area that we're doing uh, sort of having successes, I think is in terms of deriving scrap tire fiber from you know, almost 3 billion tires per year around the world and with a very low recycling rate at the moment. So we have developed a process where we are extracting these fibers from the scrap tire. And I think you can see that through a successor process, we can come up with extremely clean 
and virgin fiber, I think, at this point. And I think this virgin fiber, uh, now clearly because of its very low um, aspect ratio, we have a problem particularly with its reinforcement capability. And what we, I mean, which has been generally the case is that, that you bring these things as sort of neutral fillers, you have these sort of filler function in these fibers, and you sort of feel good about just putting them in concrete and disposing them off. But I think we are not apologizing here for the use of these fibers. And what we are saying, rather than recycling, what we are suggesting is that be upcycling. And, and this upcycling means that we are hybridizing this particular scrap tire fiber with another fiber, such as polyvinyl alcohol, and coming up with a system where you're not apologizing for loss of strength or loss of toughness, but you're getting a significantly higher synergistic response. And in fact, if you look at now this system where you have a, 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 a material which has got a, 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 a brittle response and you have basically a material which has now been reinforced with PV and STF, what you can see is that you are getting a very, very high synergy and in fact, almost a, a, a surprising response that you can increase this energy absorption capacity through this system and through this upcycling by almost a, a factor of 30 two times. The last fiber I want to describe is this bio-inspired surface exalted cellulose uh, for internal curing. Now, and this is where, I, in fact, we're learning from nature. So if you look at these bio-inspired water retention function, if you look at any plants, the plants fibrillate during hot and arid months to retain water. Now, fibrils with their large surface area, as after the fibrillation, they, they generally bind large amounts of water. Now, nature has developed this process, which is extremely useful, I think, from the point of view of actually retaining water. So we said, well, if that's indeed the case, what we could do is we could use cellulose, in fact, in a lightly fibrillated form, also for water retention, which can then become water available for uh, you know, internal curing. Now, if you look at the water in cellulose, you have about 50, uh, sorry, 20% of the water which is bound, which is mostly in the hydroxyl groups in the amorphous and low porosity regions of cellulose and hemicellulose molecules. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the free water, which is in fact useful water from internal curing perspective, is almost 80% of this water, which is mostly in lumen and cell wall pores. Now that water, which is in fact free water is available. Only thing is you need to actually desorb this water. Uh, and what we have indicated in our research is that you do have a very high water retention in these systems, but the moment you actually put the system in a low relative humidity environment, such as in a, in a desiccating cement-based system, you actually uh, de desorb all of that water. So even at low uh, you know, losses of relative humidity, which is perfect because I think this is the, the reservoir of water which I could I could bring into the cement-based system and that you can immediately actually desorb that water for internal curing systems. So here is a process that we have designed. It's generally recycled system, recycled pulp, which can then go into a lightly uh, light mechanical pulping. And I'll, I'll compare, compare that also with nanofibrillated cellulose, which actually requires a greater energy absorption. What we are doing here is not going to that extent of producing a nano system, but I think really producing a, a lightly uh, you know, fibrillated um, micro modified system or refined system, which actually what we are calling, calling surface exalted cellulose, which is actually a material which has got a water absorption capability. So we are really working at the low energy level. You can see that the energy level we are working at here, I think is at the, in the surface exalted system is not going as high as actually producing nanofibrils here. So this is an advantage, I think, in terms of energy absorption. And what you're producing is basically a surface exalted cellulose, which has in fact sufficient fibrillation, which is required now for uh, controlling or, or producing internal curing. So one thing I want to say is that in fact, in there, there's been a fair bit of work done also in my laboratory with performance biofilaments, where we're looking at actual going from micro to nano fibrils, whereas you have basically a very high uh, water absorption, cap water retention capabilities of, of up to, up to five uh, grams per gram. But that produces in fact, another functional system with tremendous other advantages. But what I want to describe today is re retaining the that functionality only microfibers not going up to nanofibrils, whereas we are conserving energy 
but we are also producing, in fact, a water-based system or, or a water extraction system, which is approximately in 1.6 gram per gram or somewhere in that vicinity, which produces, in fact, a number of other advantages in terms of really uh, looking at internal curing in the system itself. So here is your so un, unbleached uh, sort of systems, uh, such as, uh, uh, you know, different types of materials, pulp type. But the moment you're providing a light uh, refinement, you will see that we are with 100 kilowatt hour or 185 kilowatt hour refinement. I'm improving its water retention capacity to 1.6 or somewhere in that capacity. So I'm moving it from one gram approximately to approximately 60% greater. And what I'll demonstrate to you is that in fact, this light refinement is in fact very good in terms of producing internal curing in the system itself. So let me show you some uh, performance of these surface exalted cellulose right now. So one on thermoporometry. So we took these specimens and we reinforced them, tiny specimens, we reinforced them with our surface exalted cellulose. Uh, you know, subjected them to in fact thermoporometry where you're actually freezing the water. And from the rates at which the supercooling occurs, you can actually see and get a sense of really what the pore refinement is in, in the sort of the, in, in that range. And then we combine that with results from mercury intrusion porosimetry. And here is kind of the, 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 the kind of the combined holistic data, which gives you the data for mercury intrusion, intrusion porosymmetry with three volume fractions of cellulose uh, 0 0.1 0 0.3 and three here is the thermoporometry on the left, which gives you in fact the, the responses of the system with uh, you know, internal curing in the system itself uh, you know, through thermoporometry. And what you will notice is that through uh, the cellulose fiber reinforcement, uh, I'm converting quite a bit of the micro porosity now into nano porosity. And that's very exciting because the moment I'm able to convert micro porosity into nano porosity, since nano porosity at that level is not going to permeate, what that, because of its very high absorptive forces, what this means is it's actually going to give me, in fact, a benefit in terms of transport properties and, and in, indeed durability as well. So, when we looked at actually this whole system under permeability, and these are these are permeability tests that we performed uh, with with uh, you know uh, uh, cellulose fiber in it, and you will notice that in fact un under stress, for example, and this is a typical type of specimen we're de dealing with, and this shows the results of it uh, of the tests that we we performed. You will notice that at the three levels of cellulose fiber here, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0.5, and you have the plain material here. Uh, and, and and on the on the x-axis I'm plotting the stress level. On the no, on the y-axis I'm plotting the permeability, which is normalized. You will notice that under no stress level, which is the uh, the vertical axis, you will notice that there is already an influence of internal curing, which shows that in fact, without any stress, I'm actually seeing a lower permeability in the system itself. Now, as you move along the stress axis, you will notice that initially there is a drop in the permeability for all systems. What that means is there is a pore refinement or pore compression going on. But the moment that pore compression uh, exceeds, say, for example, 30% of the ultimate stress, the plain concrete just kind of takes off because there is an internal crack that develops. You have multiple cracking that's developed in the plain concrete system under compression, and you see this massive rise in the permeability. On the other hand, with cellulose uh, in this particular form, what you'll notice that there is indeed a pore refinement going on or pore compression going on as well. But because of the internal curing, I will notice that in fact, the overall permeability is far less. Now you'll notice the same thing with, with um, a diffusion control, ASTM C 1556 values. You'll notice that in fact, with the cellulose fiber, you'll also, because of chloride binding, you'll also see lower uh, diffusion coefficients. And when we put this all together in terms of understanding what happens to corrosion now uh, of rebar, when you have surface exalted cellulose in the system, so here is the chamber that we designed, we place stress on this, this has got rebar in it, and then we monitored basically the corrosion activity using number of different methods. Uh, we used the uh, number of the uh, methods of monitoring corrosion in these systems and what and with under under different load systems. And what we noticed was, in fact, the moment you have a cellulose uh, fiber in the system, there is definitely a significant delay 
in the onset of corrosion itself. And that's really, I think, all uh, I would say call for the call, call for the present is how can you define these uh, these systems and how can redesign these systems for reduced corrosion in reinforced concrete systems. So I believe this, this minor level of pore refinement, in fact, can also be very useful. If you get greater pore refinement as you go into the nanofibrillated systems, of course, the benefits are even greater. And I think some of the work that we are continuing to do here, I think, indicates that that may be the ideal way, even at low uh, volumes of these materials, to control corrosion in the system. System. So finally, I want to show you an actual application of these two fibers, the scrap tire fiber and the surface exalted cellulose. Here, this is in a First Nations community not too far from here, from Vancouver, in the Chavatal um, you know, uh, Reserve, uh, which is a First Nations community. Uh, and we placed three layers, uh, or three placements, actually, one which has got the scrap tire fiber in it, the other one, which is plain to compare it to, and then, of course, the surface exalted cellulose. And it's a fairly large site, so I think we were able to understand, really, uh, you know, the, the placement characteristics, the, the finishing characteristics, pumping characteristics, etc., all at the same time in this particular case. Uh, this is also a, a site which has got a great deal of instrumentation in it. So I'll show you some of the limited data actually on the instrumentation. So here is the sections. The section A has got our cellulose fiber in it. Section B has got um, uh, no fiber in it. So it's the plane control. And section C is the one which has got the scrap tire fiber uh, as I described in the clean state in, in it uh, basically at, at comparable dosages actually. So what we did was we placed a number of uh, you know, sensors in this particular three placements that I'm talking about, very large placements, of course, strain sensors, relative humidity and temperature sensors. And then these are wireless sensor modes, which are all solar powered. So we were acquiring the data right at the site, transmitting it over the internet actually, to, so that we can take a look at that. And these kind of shows you the fiber systems as well that we are used in this, in this particular case. Uh, a site itself, uh, it's a fairly large. So we were pumping concrete, as you can see. So we were also monitoring the air contents in these particular materials. If indeed that was a change in the air content as a result of fiber reinforcement, and what you see down there is, in fact, the finished site. Uh, as you can see, it's a beautiful area, uh, just about two hours from Vancouver, just up north. And I want to show you, uh, there's a great deal of sort of data that has been acquired, but I think I want to show you basically the strain data that has come from the strain sensors that you see on the bottom left here. So section A, you will recall, is the one with cellulose fiber. Section B is control. And section C is the one which has got the scrap tire fiber in it. And under shrinkage, you have two sets of plots here. Uh, again, it's approximately uh, uh, approximately six months apart, basically, but sort of about an hour, uh, one year after the placement of the fiber, it's of, of the placement of the uh, the, uh, the slab itself. As you can see, uh, the section A and section C are still in compression which means that there is in fact a shrinkage crack control and internal curing that's going on in the system itself. Whereas the one which is section B, which is actually uh, a plane, is slowly drifting towards a tensile mode of fracture, which means that there is, it's trying, starting to get closer to developing, developing cracks in the system. And once we look at the November 2019 strain data, you will notice that in fact in the plane placement, Indeed, we are getting into tensile stresses, which means that you are developing cracking possibilities, whereas in the other two systems, we still do not have any cracking because entire system is still in compressive loading, which means that you have a fair bit of pre-stress and a guarantee built into the system itself. So I think this data, these data indicated that in indeed for these new fiber interventions or new fiber systems in, in these kind of large placements through sensing and through structural health monitoring, one is able to actually get crack-free uh, pavements uh, set up in these particular cases. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, again, thank you for your, uh, your attention. So what I was trying to describe was some innovations in fiber systems that, that, that are, uh, uh, at least in terms of the four fibers that I'm describing here, available and that the cur and, and current work continues. Significant innovations are possible and designing engineered fibers for high-performance fiber-reinforced concrete. So I really believe 
that the current fibers that are derived from other um, industries, such as the ceramic industry, metal matrix industry, or even from the erstwhile concrete industry, uh, fiber reinforced concrete industry, where we are still dealing with, say, low performance, 30 to 40 MPU concrete systems, need to be, uh, in fact, further, uh, further modified. And, you know, we tried to describe some of the such innovations, which not only lead to higher performance, also to carbon neutrality and in terms of functionality, which will allow us to, in fact, develop other functional materials as we go forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. This is a very informative uh, lecture about uh, different types of fibers and concrete materials. Uh, uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first is that uh, wouldn't uh, so one quick question uh, bva uh, being uh, a hydrophilic uh, polymer would it wouldn't decrease the bond strength of the bva uh, coated fiber with the cement uh, building binding uh, matrix no actually it improves it because it actually allows additional bonds to be formed because of the hydroxyl alliance on the surface of the pva itself in fact, if you look at PVA fiber, some, most of the time you'll find that the PVA fiber would fracture. So in a number of these high performance systems, you coat them with oil, as you know. So no, no, there's, there's definitely an improvement in bond as with time. And we demonstrated that in our bond slip tests themselves, actually. Okay. And the second question, can you clarify uh, scrap tire fiber? Are, they, are you referring to metal fiber or uh, shredded rubber or combination of both so these we have removed the crumb completely from the system so the the process that we have designed we can get rid of the crumb completely so it goes back to literally a virgin polyester that's what this particular fiber is as you know tire uh, comprises of polyester rayon nylon uh, the other two are actually smaller percentages. Most of the tire fiber that we derived actually is polyester, as we can sort of detect from our, our analysis. Uh, so what we're doing is we're taking this pure poly, uh, the polyester fiber after the process uh, from the tire recycling, and we are hybridizing this with other fibers, such as PVA, for example. Uh, there's also been a fair bit of work done uh, uh, also hybridizing with steel, but I believe that I think hybridization is the key to up, upcycling in this case, so that we are not apologizing for the loss of strength with a very low aspect ratio polyester fiber that we are deriving from the fiber, from the tire itself. Okay. So the, uh, the next question, how old uh, uh, for the slabs that you presented in August and November? Okay, so those slabs are almost three years old now. Okay, and uh, another question is, uh, 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 you, you used uh, uh, the fibrils uh, as a reservoir, uh, internal reservoir or internal curing. Uh, for how long is this can be good? You know, for how many days or months is that can be uh, a source of uh, internal curing? So we have data for up to four years now of the surface, surface accelerated cellulose. And that four year, four year data indicates that the internal curing is def definitely a continuous process. As you know, in no concrete, 100% hydration ever takes place, which means that with internal curing, you're continually uh, hydrating cement, which, uh, which remains hitherto unhydrated. So I would think that internal curing is in fact a continual process. Okay. So another question, uh, uh, have you uh, studied the uh, crumb uh, along with the steel fiber and possible impact on concrete strength? No, I think we are not dealing with crumb in this particular case. I know there's a fair bit of work done on crumb uh, added to concrete uh, for you know, impact resistance and for bullet performance and those kinds of things. We are literally not using crumb here. Actually, we are getting rid of crumb entirely from our fiber stream so that fiber remains pure and, and uncontaminated, I call it. I see crumb as a contamination in the fiber stream. So we're using, we're removing the crumb and the crumb is recycled in some other way. So it goes to some other industry where they have benefit for crumb in other uh, you know, uh, applications. But we are not using crumb in our applications that we're dealing with. We are trying to get rid of it actually. Okay. 
So back, back to the old of the slabs uh, of uh, that you measured in August and November. He is asking uh, when you take this measurement, how old was there uh, of these slabs? Oh, the slabs were two years old at this time. Yeah. Well, the, no, the slabs are uh, the slabs are almost four years old now, but the measurements in 2019 were almost two years old. Great. Very good. So thank you, Professor Nemi, for this great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you kindly.